Hey, Adam. Yes? Are you a teacher or an artist or an artist teacher? Uh, I am an instructor. <laughs> instructor. I'm mentor Adam Manis. <laughs> mentor. <laughs> I am instructor and guide and capitan <laughs> Peter Martin. Uh, we're just trying to think of all these different names for teacher. Guru is literally the Guru. Name, and guru <laughs> is a name for a teacher. Name for, name of a hip hop artist from from your as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, this is the You'll Hear podcast. Music advice coming at you. Maybe a little bit of educational advice coming at you today. Maybe a little edutainment. Possibly. A little edutainment. Yeah. Um, we're talking about teaching today. Yeah. We're talking about pra- we're not talking about practice. We're talking about teaching. I think something that we have a little bit of uh, shared or collective experience and knowledge about. Something that we're super passionate about. I should hope so. Individually yeah. and as uh, you know, open studio, and um, yeah. I so, think more specifically, we're talking about how to build your teaching studio, right? So that it, I, there's a couple of things that you're going to want, and I think that we're, we're going to try to solve is how to make it successful, meaning like not just financially, but how to make it something that's fulfilling for you yeah. so that it's not just like a J-O-B, uh, I got to teach, right? but something that is actually something that helps you grow as a musician. Yes. That's one way. And then, of course, to help supplement any kind of performing income. Uh, it can be very, very handy to have regular teaching work. Yes. Because, you know, it's a pirate's life we're living here, Peter. Exactly. We just go I mean, from port to port, exactly. <laughs> like trying to make things work. Like ships at sea. And, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's feast, sometimes it's famine, and a, and a steady teaching gig could really help, like on any level, can really help uh, to keep a nice foundation of income happening. Yeah, and I think the beauty of it is that you can, you know, it can certainly check that box in terms of like professional income stability. It can check the box of ongoing you know, personal development edification with your craft. Absolutely. Um, and keep that kind of in balance at the same time. And also, I think it can really keep in balance um, us giving back in a way that is different, but just as important as what we do performing wise. A lot of times people think about like, I want to play music. I fell in love with performing music, playing for others. And that's my service. And I think that that's a noble thing. It's an important thing. Mm-hmm. And as an artist, like it doesn't get any better than that to me because you are you have the potential every time you sit at your instrument or pick up the microphone as your vocalist or whatever it is that you're doing, your paintbrush, to uplift, to edify, to to change somebody's life, to put a smile on them, on their face, to put a tear in their eyes, you know, to do all the, the myriad of human emotions to affect people in such an amazing way. Um, so that becomes like the focus. And then I, unfortunately, I think a lot of times people are like, oh, when, when I don't have a chance to do that, I have to teach just because I got to do something professionally. Yeah. And when you get that balance right, and it's different for everybody. It is. Uh, but if you can get that balance, you can be serving in two different ways because I always think of teaching as like having that potential sort of network multiplier effect. Of course. Because you... You know, you're still going to be playing your music and lifting up folks with that, but by teaching others to do that, and then it's like a it's like a beautiful pyramid scheme that's actually legal, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. because then they can go teach other people. <laughs> so like you're handing off multiple batons, um, and then keeping this whole beautiful ecosystem of artistry in the world and doing your part to give back. So you feel, you know, it's like whenever you donate to something or you help somebody out. Um, it's not it's it's not just an altruistic thing. I think it's a very selfish thing in a beautiful way in that you get a lot out of it. That's right. It's not just about giving to them. You get that connection with uplifting and helping others. So I look at teaching very much, you know, in in that way and then certainly for the for the side or or the the sort of corollary benefits as well as income stability and all these different things. And if you look at people that have that balance right, they're so happy. You know what I mean? Like with their because they've got they they can avoid but look we've got some young inside yeah, here today yes, hey. maybe they're coming to learn from us hey they can't see us they can't they? see us yeah, yeah yeah um but you know when you get that balance going correctly it becomes a flexible thing you can add a little bit more sometimes when you need to teaching yeah. you can take that away a little bit but i think for me it's always been an important part of my why well that that's what i was going to say is like you know the first thing that you can do is to really find your why why mm. are you teaching you know and really you know you might 
take just a sheet of paper and write down why do you want to teach? And this could really save you from the, well, I, I just need some extra income, right? Even if that's the case, what are the other reasons that you want to do this? Is it because yeah. you want to have a close connection with music? Are you asking it, me? Well, no, I'm saying... I'm, oh, I'm, I'm ready to answer I, if you I, well, no, I'm, I'm saying this is a question you would ask yourself. Is it a monologue or a podcast? What's going on? <laughs> you would want to, questions you would want to ask yourself is, is why, why am I teaching it? Yeah. You know, it can just be, of course, for the money. But, you know, as you said, like, this can be something that is part of your practice. This yes. is part of your, your life as a musician. For me, I have learned as much teaching and having good students ask good questions about what I'm teaching um, that forces you to re-examine things that you do and, and techniques that you have and why you use them mm -hmm. and how you think about them. And uh, wait, have I not turned this over as many times as I thought I have? Right. You know, because they're having a question that maybe you've never thought of about a concept. And you're like, wait, I, I need to be able to actually explain this or I need to be able to at least demonstrate this in a way that is that makes sense and that helps you to understand oh okay this is how i'm actually thinking about this this is how this is coming through me yeah you know that can be very uh, rewarding so maybe that's your why of like i'm going to use this as a tool to hone my own playing yeah you know or yeah. i'm going to use this as a tool to connect as you said to and sometimes it's a like a little bit of like kind of verify ideas and and as well like you think about like a someone who's doing research or like a philosopher or something like a lot of times they'll teach to put those ideas out there and be like wait a second is yeah. this see if it makes water yeah, yeah yeah see if it you know give it a floor run see how it plays that kind of a thing i, I find, find it, it very useful for that me too man you know i do all of these like especially with open studio and on the youtube channel a ton of stuff on like harmonic teachings and working with some of like barry harris and hank jones's concepts and and i find that as soon as i put it out there it better be sound because mm -hmm. people will tell you if That's it's right. not, you know, so you, it really forces you to make some good, uh, some good habits in like really checking on your stuff and making sure that you understand at least a little bit, uh, how it works. Right. You know? Okay. So now we've got our why, which is to save the world, right. save humanity. Next up <laughs> is to find your niche. Find your niche. So, oh, so important. It's really important because if you think about it, there's all sorts of different kinds of teachers. Think about there's a, there a college conservatory professor that teaches harmony. There's Ron Carter, who still teaches mm -hmm. lessons right. to bassists as more of really in that guru position of yep. like, I'm here to tell you what works for me and to coach you to be the best player you can be. Also, as a course available on a studio. That's right, right. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, even when you get to that very high level, that sort of pinnacle of base, it's like, wow, Ron Carter is teaching. Don't, like, I would say that his niche is actually not what you think it might be, which is like how to play like Ron Carter. No. That's not what he teaches. No, he teaches you how to be the best player, bass player you can be. Exactly. Yeah. It's more like how to practice like Ron Carter, yeah. how to think like Ron Carter, which is not exactly what you're expecting may, maybe, which is a lot of fun, really. Well, and then there's people like, you know, Roy Hargrove, mm. who notoriously was not a big talker about music, no. breaking it down. But I have friends who took lessons with him. Oh, wow. And... He would, <laughs> one friend told me a great story. He was in, I think he was in Paris and Roy was in Paris. Mm. And he somehow got a hold of him on social media or by email. And he said, let's, yeah, he's like, yes, we can have a lesson eight o'clock tomorrow. And that was the only information. Not, 8 a.m. or 8 p.m.? There was no, none of that. <laughs> and it was not, there was no, I'm, here's where I am. You have That's to very find right. me. And, and when he got there, and he and this trumpet player, who's a very good, accomplished trumpet player now, uh, he did. He figured it out. Uh -huh. He figured out where he was, and he got there. And Roy was like, "I was just wanted to make sure you were serious." <laughs> wow, you know. But that was the lesson. That's, of that's, like, that doesn't surprise me. That's very isn't that Roy. cool. Yeah, yeah. Like I was gonna say too with Roy, and like, and finding... by, by the way, I don't think he charged him for that. Like, wow. it was just like. If you're serious, let's do this. Right. It's not that about that was the price of admission. That's Roy's why. Is, yeah, is passing that along for sure. Yeah, he was very much of that like pass it, you know, pass the baton. Um, but but be serious about it and a little bit of a challenge. That doesn't surprise me. That that's on brand for him. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking when you first brought up Roy, that's another kind of find your niche and sort of where you want to do it as well because 
a lot of the teaching that I saw Roy do over the years was at jam sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't the overt, like, play this, but it was more like leading by example. But he loved, especially if there was young players in New York or wherever, you know, and when I used to tour with him, like, he was always like, man, let's go to this session. And we'd be like, man, I'm tired. Or like, I don't know. Like, we would sort of be like, well, who's going to be playing? And, you know. He's, he doesn't care. He didn't care. Yeah, yeah. He didn't care. It's like somebody that's interested. Like, he didn't necessarily look at it as like, I'm going to go there and learn something, although he might have, but it might have been like, I'm going to go there and still have just as good of a time if everybody's worse than me, which is probably the case most of the time. And that's his niche. Yeah. And maybe that's your niche is to lead by example and to build a studio based off of this sort of like coaching mentorship more yeah. than here's what scale to play over B flat blues or whatever. You know what right. I mean? Or maybe it is, I am re like, maybe you, you're thinking like, oh, you know what? I'm really... I know a lot about stride piano, or yep. I know a lot about Bud Powell. Like, you can be that person. I'm the Bud Powell person who, yep. like, if you want to learn about this, go to me. Or I'm the monk person. Like, right. you can actually... <laughs> I need a teacher. You Sorry. can... No, you can really, you know, you, all of us are a little bit of a generalist, as we have to be to yep. make ends meet, but uh, you can have a specific lane and it's okay actually to lean into that lane. So don't be afraid to lean into what you're good at. Yeah. Because you're going to attract students who say like, hey, I heard you know a lot about Bud Powell. Yeah. You know what I mean? I love Bud Powell. Can you show me that stuff? That's a niche. That's a niche. Right? Riches are in the niches. That's right. So let's talk a little business. Since okay. That is, am I getting you out of order? On no, your, no, no, no. No, you're on, on, In your bujo. So next is to find your platform. Find your platform. Again, Roy Hargrove's platform was in his hotel room that you <laughs> had to find yourself. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, but maybe your platform is your home. Maybe it's a music store. Yeah, traditional. That's a traditional. So route. and and the platform should match your niche, yeah. niche niche, or or your expertise also. Like so, you say a music uh, music store that you're gonna. You better be good at some very beginner teaching. Yep. Like, exactly. you, I'm horrible at this. That is not my niche. But if you're looking for beginner teaching and you're trying to do it over Zoom, right? That's gonna be hard. It's gonna be harder. Yeah. I mean possible but but also like know your audience in yeah. terms of your niche like people come to a music store that's so old school to be like oh i'm gonna go buy an instrument oh let me see if they have any teach like it's very casual it's what's so keeping <laughs> piano stores in business though <laughs> exactly lessons, exactly though. but you need to be able to like meet people where they are yeah. and you have to have that kind of personality but you also have to have that kind of know-how like it can't be you have to be able to break things down at that beginner level in a way that's clear and inspiring and it's not too much at the beginning and that's all the right. things that I would totally screw up in that situation. Maybe your maybe your platform is a school or a university. Right. And you can find an institution a, of higher learning. I mean I feel like if you're teaching at an institution of higher learning, you're probably already on that sort of path because right. you have to be. Right. But maybe it's not. Maybe your platform is is Zoom. Right. You know, and which we've, you know, found for us our platform at Open Studio is we have our own platform, OpenStudioJazz.com. Ever heard of it? Yeah, that's right. Familiar with its work? Uh, which maybe you build your own website. That's how this whole thing started. Is right. You and, and Dan Martin built just PeterMartinMusic.com. Peter Martin Jazz Video Piano Lessons.com. It was. <laughs> um, but, but, <laughs> but it's also it doesn't kitchy. have to be it's it kitschy. It doesn't have to be one platform because right. now, like for instance, Open Studio. We are, our platform is a podcast. Right. It is a YouTube channel. It yeah. is actually two YouTube channels. That's true. It is. We go live all the time. It is openstudiojazz.com. Yeah. It is Zoom and Open Studio Pro. Yep. Um, and it's probably some other things I'm not, I'm even forgetting. It's Instagram. Right. It's YouTube Well, it shorts. becomes, it becomes a matter of like when we talk about platform, don't get too, I would encourage folks, don't get too caught up in which platform should I teach on Instagram or my own site or whatever? It's like, what can you, like we've created a whole system because we've got a lot of different students in a lot of different places yeah. and we're trying to serve with our niche is very much jazz, jazz piano, jazz bass, jazz drums, but very much like defined in terms of that. But then what I think we've, done is crafted and continue to do is to really cra craft a platform and a combination of things that best serve our community, our students in an ongoing way to be able to access the information in different ways. Sometimes that's an old school PDF. Sometimes that's a printed book. Sometimes that's watching a pre-recorded video. Sometimes that's a live community based session. Or a with podcast you. or yeah, whatever. Yeah, sometimes it's this kind of thing. Sometimes it's a YouTube video where it's very broad because anybody searching for something on altered scales yeah. is going to come to us. So it's like you want to kind of fit to the audience and fit to the platform as opposed to the other way around to be like, well, what platform am I going to go on? 
figure out what it is you're going to do, what your what your area of expertise, what your niche yeah. is, and then craft a platform. And that could be as simple as a Skype lesson. Do people still do that? Skype lessons? Well, they do more Zoom now. Right. Zoom has killed Skype. And the whole advantage, I would say, to doing something online, it's not necessarily b- better or worse um, than in person. I mean, a lot of times like you alluded to, you know, like a beginner lesson or maybe with a kid, you know, a young person um, at piano is going to be ideal in an in-person situation. Yeah. Um, but the advantage to doing things online and if you do want to teach and feel like your niche is so specific is that there might in the city you live in only be like seven people or three people or maybe nobody yeah. that needs what you're given. Whereas when you go online with it, you've got access to the whole world. There might be a hundred people, more than you could even handle that are interested and need what you have to teach. So it opens you up to a worldwide kind of market and audience, which is very exciting. Well, and it doesn't have to be just Zoom lessons, you know, live in person. It doesn't have to even be, you know, YouTube videos. Like one of, I would say, the most prolific teachers in modern uh, social media-ness is our friend of the show, Rick Beato, with his PDF download. Rick, Be- Rick who? The Beato book. The Beato book. I like the way you say it. Popular that. Beato book. But think right. about that. That's his main mm-hmm. source of teaching, right? Yeah. I mean, he has his YouTube videos, which are very educational. But that Beato book is really, you know, in the in the nuts and bolts of teaching yes. his whole thing, right? And and his short video lessons, which are a very different kind of right. medium too, but but convey specific information in a really cool way. But I think his Beato book is probably his most popular thing. Yeah. So you can actually, do, and that's a PDF download. Like right. you can make a PDF download and then you do what Rick does. And that brings us to our last point, which is find your audience. Yeah. And you find that on social media. You find it on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, yep. wherever you got to find it. And if you have something, then a lesson to sell or lessons to sell, that's building your studio. That is a modern version of building your studio. You can self-publish, you can self-market, and it you can make a difference. And yeah. you can also learn because people are going to give you feedback on the PDF. That's you know, right. You have to have your shit together on on all the pedagogy and all that stuff. So The feedback loop can be really uh, destructive <laughs> and disheartening and frustrating and troll-esque. <laughs> but it can be, you know, if you... Go if if you approach it with the mindset of like being able to filter out stuff that that is just people trolling or whatever, it can be really helpful. And it's an important thing. I mean, it took me actually, I'm ashamed to say, years to get over this concept of like really listening to not every single individual feedback point from all of your students, but understanding the general kind of feedback right. from a, a number of them you and that that's so valid right. you know and important and not to be like no it's supposed to be this way because i learned it this way and back in my like as soon as you start thinking like that you're not going to be an effective you're going to be right but you're, you're going to be correct but not right right and also you can't and and the flip side of that it's the middle way you can't also just change everything with everybody's whim right all the time you have to have some kind of common ground get the get the sort of the temperature of your studio and then you can mold what you're doing to that temperature, you know, right. to the general consensus. Like, because oftentimes it's not even like, uh, you know, students are needy or the, or you're being dogmatic. It's more just like you're either talking over them or talking under them. Yeah. So you can actually talk about the same thing, just sort of dial in how you describe it or, uh, and you know, start instead of start starting here, start back here right you're going towards this right right because you got to be able to like it's it's like it, a, a coach like um of an athletic endeavor say running like you can have the perfect training plan for a world-class athlete mm-hmm. that is just finely tuned and then you can insist on that for just a recreational athlete that maybe aspires to get to that level but you don't meet them, but you're like, you know what? No, you have to have the best of everything and you're going to do this. They're not going to be able to accept that. Like in order to be able to find what is it that needs to work for them to not only to get better. Yeah, of course, everybody needs the best instruction at all time. Everyone needs to travel in the backseat of a S-class Mercedes. You know, that would be better than, but, but you also have to meet people where they are to get them to the next point, to get them to the, that's what I think brilliant teaching is. And so when you've got groups of people and you're doing it online or you're making videos or PDFs for a number of different people you've it's not about dumbing things down but it's about making them high quality 
accessible, and ultimately serving the goal of helping people get better and more connected with the music, become a better pianist, become a better improviser, become, you know, like when Roy Hargrove, and it's one high level aspiring trumpet player, you got to have him jump through a few more hoops, yeah. but he's not going to do that to everybody. No. You know, it's like, it has to be situational and yep. appropriate for where they are in their trajectory as an artist. It's great stuff, man. Well, yeah. good luck starting your teaching studio. If you're thinking about it, I encourage you to do it, not just for, uh, like I said, not just for extra bread, but for actually helping you on your musical journey. It, yeah. It helps. Absolutely. It really does. Make sure you get your why first, and then you're going to be good. Uh, let's talk Practicing about it. all 12 keys, good to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's my line. <laughs> what about, uh, do we have a, some kind of a, uh, condition, contract, agreement? Agreement. Gentlemen and ladies agreement. Wait. Now, I got to warn you, a lot of warning, our audience warning. is a little bit raw. And they don't always have the most gentlemanly or, or ladylike demeanor. They're running a marathon without Vaseline? Okay. Exactly. A little bit raw, you know, rough around the edges, which is fine. But in order to fully participate in this agreement, you've got to act like a gentleman. You've got to act like a lady. At least for a minute. As you're pressing, what? The subscribe button. The subscribe button on YouTube. And you might say, what is YouTube? Well, go to YouTube.com, search for... You'll hear it. You'll hear it. Yeah. And you'll find us. It doesn't matter if you're not watching it there. Feel free to watch. Don't we look great? But um, mm. subscribe there because it's a lot easier than subscribing to the Apple Podcast. Is it iTunes? Is it on your phone? Are you driving? Is it Spotify? What the hell is going on? Is it Stitcher? I, I know mean, we got a lot of people on Stitcher still. Just to be safe. Yeah. You might as well subscribe everywhere. You can. I like this. You're always you're always pushing it a little just, more. I like just, that. You know, and then make sure to leave a comment. That's part of the the new agreement. The new gentleman leave and ladies us a comment. Agreement. Subscribe comment. and 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 basically just affirm it. It doesn't have to be a highfalutin thing, right? Say agreement adhered to. Right, right. Yeah. Agreement. You could just be like done slash a lady. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Slash gentleman. Bam. Slash lady. Until next time. You'll hear it. Steamboat Springs, Colorado, currently. I'm in Indianapolis. Hey, how's it going, guys? Andrew, hi. Because I feel inspired to play something else from your play. Okay, okay, that's great. <laughs> I think using the metronome is a great tool, but it's not the only tool. All of the answers are really in the music. What does it mean to live in a groove, be in a groove? Until next time, happy practicing.